uh, tonight, our principle that we are looking at, and it's one of my favorite things to talk about because it's one of the things I don't have and I should have and y'all should have, but it's hard to hang on to, and that's peace. And I think we all want that. The principle is God's peace comes from oneness with God. In other words, you can't expect to have peace if you don't have a relationship with God. I know with me, and it may be with you too, at night, especially when everything is quiet um, and I can't go to sleep, then my thoughts start twirling and um, I want to sleep and I want to get the rest I need, but I'm thinking about responsibilities and problems and, uh, you know, how you try to focus on counting sheep. I don't know if anybody does that anymore, do they? Last mm -hmm. resort. Last resort. Um, or maybe you listen to white noise machines or don't sit there. I guess <laughs> 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 she was thinking about it. <laughs> but um, I think in those moments at night whenever our thoughts are going crazy that um, you just give anything for Peace, just genuine peace. Um, I think we all realize that what we think makes a huge difference in how we feel, what we do, how we sleep. Um, a quote by John Milton says, the mind is its own place and in itself can make heaven of hell and hell of heaven. And that's probably true. <coughs> We all have, ladies, a secret closet tucked away in the hallways of our mind. It's a thought closet, and usually what we store in that thought closet is not good because it's things that happened a long time ago. It's hidden secrets that maybe other people don't know about. It's insecurities that we have hid from others, maybe lies former failures in our life we keep them in that thought closet and it seems in those times when our thoughts are going crazy that our minds keep reaching into the dark corners of that thought closet and retrieving troublesome things that we've stored away over the, the years over the course of our life now, many times in this class, in fact, sometime I'm going to make us all sing it. I have referred to Randy Travis's song, Digging Up Bones, <laughs> and it applies here. <clears throat> Exhuming things better left alone. And that's what we do, dig up bones. But when given the right chance and the right environment in our life, we bring up things in our mind that should have been discarded years ago. Sort of like some of the clothes in our closet. Anybody? <laughs> Every year, I don't know about y'all, but I make a, a, a pathetic attempt to clean out my closet. And I hate to say this to y'all, closets. <clears throat> because I don't know why. And... You know, I said during the retreat time, you find out things about people, and Karen's going to go, yeah, I knew this from this weekend. I, it seems that once I buy something and hang it in my closet, that I kind of feel attached to it, responsible for it, and I just can't get rid of it. <laughs> Some would call me a hoarder. Karen, this weekend at the retreat, they gave us a little container of peaches. <laughs> and do you remember that, Annette? The little containers of fruit. <clears throat> and I took one and I didn't eat it. And Karen, I don't know, Bill said, Why aren't you eating the peaches? And I said, I'm going to save them for later. And then the next day, Karen said, Because we were all in the same room, she said, When are you going to eat those peaches? And I said, Sometime. <laughs> and so I didn't eat them the next day. And then Sunday when we were leaving, Bill said, I'm not taking those. <laughs> Are you going to eat those peaches? And I said, 
I'll eat them at home. And I packed them and they're in my refrigerator. <laughs> so y'all can see that if I have problems with clothes and peaches, I have problems with thoughts that I hang on to. And I definitely have done that. Our thought closets are crammed with everything that we've placed there over the years. And some of it is wonderful memories, whatever, but most of it's outdated and out of place. When I was thinking about this lesson, I made a vow that I would try harder not to keep clothes. I don't know about y'all. How many have clothes in your closet that are at least five years old? Seven years old. <laughs> 10 years old. Yay, I'm not alone. <laughs> I find that thing out that it's. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Donna, were you just busy with your hands or do you really not have any clothes? She said, who does? And I said, I do. But you put your hand down at seven and 10. She was Well, because out. I've had them so long, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Are you really that good? That is right. I, I don't know how long, That's but all true. I know is. They went out of style and they're back. That's <laughs> right. And that's what I keep. That's how I just. And they still fit. I, that's I, how I just. Want. You're a winner. Oh, and they, they still fit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't do that with Bill. I'll say to him, when are you going to get rid of those stupid wide ties? You're never coming back. And I'll make him get rid of all the wide ties. And then five years later, that's all the men wear wide ties. You know, that it's different with men and women. Um, you know the story in Mark, Mark 5, of the woman with the problem with bleeding. And you know what, ladies, when men teach this lesson, I want to just stand up and say, don't even try. You don't have a clue. <laughs> you know, about what this poor woman has, has gone through. But it... This story has meaning in our lesson tonight because this woman talked to herself. Now, we all, and we've talked about this before, carry on conversations in our mind. And we don't know her name, but we are given access to her thought closet. And it seems that we have some things in common. This woman had issues, and so do, you, so do I, and so do you, but one was insurmountable, and she'd had it for 12 years. It had challenged her in every way, physically, emotionally, mentally, um, drained her financially, and kind of ostracized her from society. You remember when a woman was bleeding, she was considered unclean. And this poor woman had been bleeding for 12 years. So basically, my guess is she couldn't be married. She probably couldn't have children with this kind of issue. And she had experienced, I'm sure, a lot of embarrassment. And no, no physician could heal. She just kept going to doctors. And as we talked about, she was drained financially. Um, Mark sums up her life in one sentence, and that's in verse 26 of chapter 5. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And you know, ladies, if any of you in here have ever dealt with female problems, um, they can be very frustrating. And, you know can range from anything, anything from bleeding to pain, whatever. But I can't even imagine this woman, and we're talking before the times of tampons and pads. I can't imagine what her life must have been like for those 12 years. But anyway, she must have heard rumors about Jesus and stories about him, probably about the miracles that he had uh, performed and how he could heal illnesses. And she heard apparently that he was coming to her village. And she bravely 
and courageously, because think about this, what it involved for her to leave her home and go find Jesus. And I'm sure it wasn't hard to find him because there, the Bible says in the scripture that there were throngs of people following him. But you know how as a little kid, if you heard there was a parade and I know in Clovis, we go down on Main Street and there was always, a, and as a little kid, I would wriggle my way up to the front, you know, so I saw the parade. I can see her doing that, probably wriggling her way so that she had a good spot, good vision of Jesus coming. And then there he was, just a few yards away. But at this time, he was walking very purposefully with Jairus. Now, some people say Jairus. I don't like that, so I'm saying Jairus, um, who was a leader in the synagogue. And I can imagine, because you remember the story in the beginning of chapter, no, I think it's verse, uh, what, 20, whatever. Uh, Jairus had come to him and said, my daughter is dying. Will you please come and heal her? So they're in the middle of that conversation. And this woman sees Jesus. And just as fast, he's walking past her. And she did something unimaginable. She extended her arm from the middle of the crowd to brush her fingers across the hem of his robe. And the Bible tells us that immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Ladies, can you imagine how that must have felt to her after 12 years of that feeling? I don't know, you know, it's been so long since I've had a period, but um, <laughs> I remember when I did that, you know, you know when you're in your period, you know, I'm so glad men aren't in here, but you know that feeling, and she was having this year after year after year after year, and to feel it stop, and know, I, I can't even imagine how she must have felt. But I also know that it took radical courage for her to do that. It was desperation. That's all it was. Because we're talking about first century Israel. A woman was not allowed to touch a man in public, especially not a rabbi. And the gospel writer Mark gives us a clue. She talked to herself. In verse 28, we walk into her thought closet as she says to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And you know what, ladies? I don't think that was the first conversation she had with herself. I think she planned it out. Where should I, where's the best place I can, how many of you talk to yourself? Out loud. <laughs> Nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I say I'm talking to the dogs, but I'm really talking out loud to myself. But I think before she went, she had a lot of conversations with herself about possibly even saying, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should. I have to. You know, all kinds of conversations. <laughs> Most of us have a thought life a little like concrete. It's all mixed up and extremely rigid. And we have a mishmash of kind of good thinking and bad thinking. And you all know that all of us in this room would do well to clean out our thought closet. Um, you're probably like me. You have some old ideas, some old opinions, some old perceptions old self-centered attitudes that tend to influence now your actions. You may have developed those when you were a teenager, but they still, if they're in your thought closet, affect how you do things. And the Bible calls us to a renewal of our minds. That's change. Romans 12, 2, do not conform any longer 
to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Can we know God's will? Karen told us last week we can. It all begins in the mind with what we choose to think about and what we choose to dwell upon. And tonight we're going to look at seven categories of thought that will do great damage to your peace. And you cannot have that peace promised to us with some of these thoughts. The first one is pretty obvious, sinful thoughts. Um, and that includes lustful desires. And that's not just sex. That's money, power, prestige, um, anything that makes you look better than anyone. And lust and peace cannot dwell in the same heart. It's just not possible. <clears throat> you know, lust is a controlling desire that makes all of us challenge our thinking about something we're getting ready to do, even if it's contrary to God's will. It can include thoughts of anger, resentment, envy, bitterness, so many things. Um, controlling fears. I mean, sometimes I know Anita Price and I were talking about this this week about just fears that, you know, are stupid, but yet we have them. Um, the devil's deception, Satan's deception, is that you can have those thoughts and still have peace. And you know that's not right. God's truth is that unless you confront those thought patterns, if they're sinful, confess them, be forgiven, and begin to trust the Holy Spirit to lead you back to the positive godly patterns of thinking that we should all have. <coughs> the second one is self-limiting thoughts. I, I have heard people say, and honestly, I've probably said it, I feel like God is calling me towards this ministry, but um, I don't know. I'm kind of busy right now. I just don't know if I have time. How many of you ever felt a calling but just didn't feel it was the right time in your life for it? Um, I know God has this for me, but I don't think I'm worthy to receive it. I'm not spiritually mature enough to receive it. I know people from my background just usually don't succeed. Those are self-limiting thoughts. Um, they typically come from rejection, lack of worth or lack of love. And the more you put yourself down, the more you deny God's ability to raise you up to do what you were, your purpose for this line. But if you've ever known a person that is restless, anxious, frustrated, it's a, typically a self-limiting thought person. There is a part of his or hers potential that is longing to be used, but that thinking is keeping it bottled up and the result is no peace. Number three is erroneous thoughts. Sometimes we think um, incorrectly because we are ignorant. Now, I don't mean that in a demeaning way. I mean, we don't have all the facts. Like, uh, we don't really know the motivation of a person. We think we do. We don't really know the truth about a, a circumstance, or we don't know all the facts of a, of a situation. Now, most people, I would say maybe 60% of people tend to think the worst about other people, Karen not included. She's trying to keep her mouth shut because she knows that that's her. Um, but let me tell you, I can give you two examples um, about 
a week or two ago, Bill and I were going to take some clothes to the Blessing Center. And um, so we drove up. And I don't know if you know now, but used to they had that bin and you could put your clothes in there. But for whatever reason, I'm going to talk to Santiago about it. They nailed it shut. Peggy, tell him I don't like that. Nobody does. Okay. <laughs> and so you can't put your clothes in. So you just have to leave them out by the door of the blessing center. Or if you have a key, you get in the church. But we were in a hurry. So we were just going to leave it out there. Okay. So we were in the back and loading the car. And this woman drives up, and uh, she gets out of the car. Never seen her before in my life. That doesn't mean anything, because you know in Green Rock, the two services. Never, I don't think I've ever seen her before in my life. And uh, she just started taking the clothes, putting them in the back of her car. Well, Karen would have thought <laughs> that lady must really need those clothes. Nora thought that lady is a thief and somebody, you know, that <laughs> So I said to Bill, don't put our clothes out there. <laughs> now, how sinful am I? And the lady saw Bill and I talking. And so she said to us, she yelled to us, they said I could do this. <laughs> well, I thought, no, they didn't. Karen would have thought, well, there you go. Somebody told her she could do it. <laughs> that, that's the difference between Pollyannas and people who are realistic. <laughs> Was it trying to help if somebody told her she could do it? No, no. And I, <laughs> I, I did not leave my clothes. <laughs> uh, but I'm just giving that as an example of how wrong of me to do that. I didn't have all the facts, did I? I was ignorant of the situation. I, for all I know, she's Santiago's great aunt, you know, or somebody. And she needed all those clothes. And because there were about five bags and she took them all. She didn't even look in them. Your clothes or bills? All of us, you know. <laughs> what is that? Because you were saying you don't get rid of your clothes. I know. No, I do get rid of some. Of them. <laughs> um, if you if you don't know all the facts, and sometimes it's easy to judge. But, and I did that with that little lady, um, and I did not have all the facts. But that can that can do with a lot of personalities. I don't know if you've known people that you thought were maybe uh, haughty and arrogant, and they just had a quiet spirit. Or somebody that you thought was real prideful, and they just had solid confidence in themselves. Um, or what you might perceive to be a manipulative attitude is maybe somebody just trying to really help. I'm just saying, if you don't have all the facts, then you, you have erroneous thinking many times. Um, you should evaluate once in a while why you hold to the opinions that you do. And, and I definitely do that. So the second example was, <laughs> I was telling Bill about a book I was reading about the history of chickens. And I don't know about y'all, you may know where chickens came from. Don't say God, I know that. But I'm just saying, where did they come from? So I was reading this history. And um, I thought maybe Indians brought or you know, I just didn't know where they came from. But anyway, I had just read a chapter and I told Bill, this, this chapter was so horrible that I don't think I can sleep tonight because it was about the popularity of cockfights in the Philippines and how they build these humongous coliseums for these cockfights. And <laughs> it's sort of like part of their culture, like bullfights are part of Spain and Mexico's culture. And um, they take better care of their roosters than they do their children, from what I was reading. I mean, the roosters get fed first. And then the children, the roosters get vitamins, the children don't get any. And tons of money changes hands during these cockfights. In fact, what I read was, and I looked this up just today to see if it still happens, and it does. 
World Slasher Cup 2021, and that's those cockfights in the Philippines. 650 cockfights, 650 roosters that die. And I told Bill, don't ever ask me to go to the Philippines. I will never go there. That is the most inhumane thing I have ever heard of. And in the next breath, I was saying, you know what? I'm, I'm teaching this class and I'm trying to think of an example in my life of erroneous thinking. And he said, are you kidding? <laughs> You just judge the entire country of the Philippines <laughs> by one chapter you read in a book. I just hate it when he talk, right? But anyway, just two examples in my life. But, um, <clears throat> another major error that people have in their thinking is to think that they're alone and isolated. And the truth is, is that nobody is really alone. God has someone that he can give to you as a friend, as a mentor, uh, a counselor, or a neighbor. And the person who says, I'm, all, I'm just all alone, is a person who perceives that nobody is giving to her. What's the best antidote for loneliness? Help somebody. Help somebody. Give to, to others. Um, when you turn from being I must receive to I must give, then you, you're going to find yourself in relationships and you just won't be alone. There's somebody who needs something that you alone have, have to give. And it may be your, just your listening ear or your advice, uh, your prayers, or perhaps just um, your, your presence. We also have errors in thinking about God and how many of you have known people who blame God for all the bad things that happen in their life? I don't know if you've known it, but I have where it just, you know, anything bad that happens, they, they blame God. And let me tell you, ladies, that's the work of Satan right there, changing your thinking. Um, <clears throat> We also have errors in our thinking about God's word. Um, many people believe this is not accurate anymore. It's old fashioned. It's not up to date. It can't be right. Not everything in here. And you know what? <clears throat> That's just wrong on all counts. And without this word, there's really no basis for us to trust God. Or to know that he will love us regardless and forgive us. Or really just to know with certainty what's right and what's wrong. And we also have errors in thinking about salvation. I don't know if you've heard people say, I've sinned too much to be saved. I, we had a lady tell Bill and I not too long ago, I can't come to that church because I've done too many bad things. Well, that's erroneous thinking. And how many of you, I just heard this, a sermon on this not too long ago, when you were younger, maybe, maybe even now, how many of you have worried that you have committed the unpardonable sin? <laughs> when I was growing up, I remember our preacher taught, did a sermon on that, and I went home and told my mom and dad, I, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin, you know, <laughs> My dad said, just the mere idea that you're asking about it means you haven't. <laughs> um, th these are the kind of errors that destroy your peace when you start thinking about all that. Finally, we have errors in our thinking about the church. If you believe that you don't really need the fellowship of other Christians. And ladies, boy, this has really hit home during the, the pandemic. Um, how many of you got kind of comfortable in your pajamas and a cup of coffee doing church? It, it's easy, isn't it? I mean, Bill and I did. I thought, man, this is a comfortable couch. And my dogs are here. My coffee's here. And, you know, if I want to go to the bathroom during Dale's sermon, I can, you know. And so the pandemic has made us all kind of analyze our feelings toward fellowship with other Christians. 
But tell me why we need that. Why do we need that? You need other people. What? I mean, you need other people. Yes. For encouragement. You know, encouragement. God made us that way. Yes. That's right, Debbie. That's why I love Santi. You're not supposed to hug people, but you come to the blessings and Sonny will give you a hug. I was like, I'm dying. Somebody's got to give me a hug. I know. You go to the blessings, sir. So Sonny said, I don't care. I'll give you a hug. I was like, thank you. That is, I mean, that is right. That's why we need each other. Just like all of you said, but it's, it's for encouragement and it's an opportunity for us to encourage others when we can. And also, I know uh, a lot of people felt spiritually disconnected. Yeah, you may watch Dale and hear the sermon, but you're not really feeling close to anyone. You know, you just kind of lose that. And so I, I am so thankful that we can now come to church and that's just a blessing. And I don't know about you, but there's been many times I've come to church with a less than positive attitude. And then by God's grace, someone will say something kind to me that I didn't expect. Someone will say something encouraging to me or a scripture will be read, or a song will be sung that will touch me, and I realize I needed this. How many of you typically feel better after you leave church than when you? Cheryl, you shot that hand up pretty fast. <laughs> but it's true. Um, we feel better just going to church. Um, number four is unrealistic thoughts. How many of you have ever known anyone who thought, I can be on a praise team and they can't carry a tune in a bucket? There's people like that. <coughs> Thank you. I'm the one that can't carry the tune in the bucket. <laughs> we had Annette this weekend who is definitely, if we can get rid of Dewey and get the <laughs> there, but, No. What about people who think, I think I could be an accountant. And they made F's and math. You know, that's unrealistic thoughts. Um, many times we pursue goals that we need to kind of think about a second time, may not be in line with God's plan, and it may be the pathway to uh, not being successful, and that definitely <coughs> does not bring peace. Number five is rebellious thoughts. And those who engage in that kind of thinking say, I know what this book says, but I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. And <clears throat> I probably told you this before too, but my dad always told me, people will do exactly what they want to do. And I found that to be true all through my life. Um, <clears throat> I, I remember talking to someone not too long ago and I said, you know what? What you want to do is really not in line with God's word. And they really said, I, I know it's not, but I'm going to do it anyway. Anytime you have an idea that just feels right in your thinking, in your emotions, you need to stop and reevaluate your thoughts and weigh it against the commands of God because there's no peace for a rebellious heart. Number six is obsessive thoughts. How many of you have ever had that? Cheryl, are we having some fun? <laughs> <laughs> she <laughs> would be the only one. I appreciate your opinion. Oh, no. <laughs> if it's a worry, especially. Yes. It's just obsessive. Um, they harass us, obsessive thoughts do. And they kind of, um, they typically have a root in this kind of attitude. I've got to have this. I've got to possess this. I've got to control this. And in women's experience, what do you think it is? I've got to fix this. Those are the thoughts that turn obsess obsessive and they're very hard to get rid of. 
and they bring us no peace. And the last one is sort of like obsessive, enslaved thoughts. Um, this is one step beyond obsessive. We typically see this in alcoholics or drug addicts. It's not like I've got to have this. This is I've got to have this or else kind of thoughts. And or I can't live without this or possessing this or that. All of us in here may have these thoughts at one time or another in our life. And I think it's a habit that we form because of those thought closets that we have. And it's very easy just to say, stop it. But, you know, especially with the obsessive thoughts, we just cannot do that. Um, we all have, God gave us a control mechanism to determine what we will think. And we can either think I choose to trust God or I choose to be overwhelmed. And one thing we've talked about this in class before is memorizing scripture. How many of you memorize scripture? Anybody? When I was a little girl, I <laughs> I've been helping the girls memorize. Has anybody scripture? memorized the scripture lately? Sarah, have you memorized one lately? Well, I helped Jolie on the way to church memorize hers so she could get some tickets. Okay. But well, I still don't remember what it was. Let's <laughs> <laughs> hope she did. Well, well, do you remember what it was about? Well, I'm putting you on the spot. Sarah, do you remember? We said it the whole ride over here. All of us, all five of us in the car. No, I do not remember what it is. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start a scripture. Yeah. You to finish it. What? I've heard a lot of things in the last 45 minutes. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's true. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. What can Oh, he makes this. He it's makes like me lie, lie down, down in green pastures. pastures. He, he leads, leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. <laughs> he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name. Said. I am so proud of y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, sometimes know. you can just memorize a few scriptures that you can call. I mean, really, is it not kind of peace forming to think of God making you lie down in green pastures? It doesn't say God gives you the option. He makes you lie down in green. He leads you on purpose beside still waters. Isn't that peaceful thinking? So just scriptures like that. What's another scripture that would be easy? Well, the end of that one surely gives the mercy to follow me all the things in my life. Yes. That first part is peaceful, but the last part is such a promise that it makes me feel. Okay, what's the first sentence of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which I am Okay, you can say the next. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I mean, y'all y'all know more scriptures than what you think you do. So is uh, now I'm laying me down to sleep. That's not a scripture. Okay, I'm just, I'm at, that's what I was asking. Is it okay? Isn't it? It's not, but it's a good prayer. It's, and I've done that multiple times when I go to bed at night. Yeah. All I do in that to help myself go to sleep. Uh -huh. I know. I mean, anything that can help us relax. But you're right, Donna. That has some yeah. God language yeah. in it. <laughs> What's well, another scripture that the fruit of the spirit is? It's peaceful. Can anybody name the fruits of the spirit without clapping their hands? <laughs> Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 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 faithfulness and self control. Y'all are, are amazing. <laughs> yeah, I kind of sing songs. 
Okay, what's another scripture? I can cheat because I have them written down. But well, really, a name? If, if they're a song, I wrote the scripture down that goes to the song. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of song songs. Or yeah. Songs Created or songs. me. Clean heart. Mm -hmm. oh, that's right. That's and the the deer another pass, song. The deer pass. Yeah, the deer pass. Deer pass oh, yeah. water. Mm -hmm. That's a song. What's another song we sing that's a scripture? Can you think of any? I know. Um, what's that one about uh, I've been crucified with Christ? Christ. Christ. I, I live. Yeah, yeah, not I. Christ. Christ. So, see, even with songs, you can learn scripture that will be a comfort to you. And I think the key is remembering, trying to remember to use those scriptures mm -hmm. right. to give you peace. And what's the key to memorizing? repetition mm -hmm. saying it over and over because i'm like sarah i may think i memorized something and a day later i can't tell you what the first word was hardly so it, it's just repetition but i'm telling you ladies if you learn to call scripture to mind it will help in your thought closet um, <clears throat> anytime your thoughts turn south then think of a scripture a good one to memorize. I've tried to memorize this scripture and I cannot do it because I, if these things were in alphabetical order, I could probably do it. Philippians 4 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, true. whatever is just. See, there you go. That's where I stop. Yes. Noble, noble. Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things as skipping to the end of verse nine and the God of peace will be with you. That's a good scripture to memorize, but like I said, if I had it in alphabetical order, I might remember all those words, but I just cannot seem to, to memorize the first song for words. <laughs> maybe there's a song that you should yeah. think about. Yeah, song. <laughs> and it would be easy. But um, honestly, I don't think of all these things in this way all the time. I just don't. Like with the little lady at the Blessing Center. And the people in the Philippines that I still haven't forgiven. So, <laughs> well, they never tell us where chickens come from. Well, they think they originated in China. Oh, okay. From archaeologists finding chicken bones. And so, but it's uncertain. I mean, really, it's a miracle we have chickens. <laughs> I know you don't look at it. Such a blessing. blessing. <laughs> I always say, Karen, why don't you want to? She brought her mother over one time, Mabel. Not Mabel. Mabel. Yeah. <laughs> see, I can't remember. <laughs> and I, she, Mabel said, I want to see your chickens. And I said, Karen, you want to come up? No, I don't want to see those nasty chickens. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's okay, like, mom, you go look. <laughs> but well, they did <laughs> Any comments, ladies, on your thoughts? And I, I think that sometimes when a situation arrives, like for example, if something's really hard, you Philippians four thirteen pops in my mind. I think mean, all things through Christ. Right, the yeah, that's a good scripture. You know, but I think it's not always our default. You know, when things get hard or we're stressed. I don't think sometimes it's not. It should be our <clears throat> default setting to go remember scripture. Yes. But I think, like I said, I think songs mm -hmm. come to my mind mm -hmm. more than that. Even if they aren't scripture, most of them point to scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, have any of y'all ever had ignorant thoughts about someone so that I will feel better about myself and the lady? <laughs> yes. yes, every day. Every day. I'm too much cool. At least <laughs> once. <laughs> I'm not that bad. <laughs> but anybody want to share? I was going to say, my boss has always said that when you don't know what the whole story is, you make up a story in your head and you tell yourself that story until you believe it. That is exactly right. And it becomes right. the truth for you then. And so I, since I've been working with him, I've tried really hard anytime I don't know what's happening for sure, 
not to tell myself a story about what's happening. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> to wait until I find out what it is. And I think it's made me a better person because I don't automatically assume somebody's doing something wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. And like you like you tend to do anyway, but he's always saying that is you're telling yourself a story. He'll, he'll stop you in the middle of something and say, you're telling yourself a story now. What really happened? Yeah. You know? And you're right. And, you know, I think I read that before about eyewitness people mm -hmm. to a crime or something. Everybody they may see it, but they tell themselves a story. And it mm -hmm. may not be accurate, but it's the story they've told themselves. And that's what they, they present. So, and you'll remember that for you, like you'll... Have you ever been like telling someone a story about something that happened a long time ago? And they're like, no, that's not what happened at all. <laughs> but like, that's how you remember it because that's what you told yourself. So you just assume that it was real. Yes, children are real good yeah. at that. <laughs> yeah, part of that is just your perception. Yeah. Yeah. See it through. Yeah. yeah. My brothers and sisters remember stories completely different than I did. <laughs> Which is wrong. Which is yeah. wrong. They're all <laughs> I was talking this weekend at the ladies' retreat about how we interpret what we hear. It's what sort of speaks what you're saying. About when Bill, he's taller than I am, and he said to me one day, casually, the top of the refrigerator is dusty. <laughs> and I heard, you're in charge of the house, and you haven't done a good job of I made up a whole big story of what he said, and he didn't say any of it. And later I said to him, how dare you say anything about, you know, we got into that. And he said, I didn't say any of it. I just noticed. You saw it. Give him a easy. duster. <laughs> right. You can see it. You can see it. Amen. Right. Amen. <laughs> Okay, Cheryl says, please continue to pray for my stepmom, Joy, as she will be having surgery May 14th in Oklahoma. Now, it, I it's didn't think it was going to be in Oklahoma City. No, it's always been. She was okay. in Oklahoma. So. Okay, so that's May, my, that's a, two or three weeks away. Sounds that's three reason. weeks. Why is that so? She, she, it was originally scheduled for March, and then she got that UTI that was septic. And so they're just being overly cautious to make sure that no infection is in her blood still. And she's gotten good, apparently she got some good checkups today, but then I guess then they're just scheduling things. Mm -hmm. So how's she doing with all that? I don't really talk to her in a little while, but she seems okay with it. I'm sure she's worried. She, she wants to just get it over with, you know, mm -hmm. so, so this is a uh, long to pray for Step, Mom. Thank you, Lisa Marie. Any other prayer requests, ladies? I heard today that, you know, you announced Karen Higginson home. And I don't know if you guys have checked her or not, but I understood that they did her surgery one day and she home the next. Yeah. I mean, she was like outpatient practice. Yes, and I didn't know this. I didn't even know it was possible that they removed her kidney laparoscopic. I didn't know you, how could you do that? Mm -hmm. so, well, especially when there was a mask on it. So, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Maybe be a little bit wrong. But, that, but anyway, they said as long as she could walk down the hall three times, she could go home. And she did. And they let her go. Maybe there's an incision plus the Maybe so, Sarah. I just thought that sounded a little... I don't know where they... Just, I don't know how big her kidneys are. Does anybody know? They're, you know, like, I'm oh, very big, aren't they? They're, they're not that big, but they're, you know, they're not your fist. Maybe a little bit size. Size. They may just take little chunks out. Yeah. Hmm. But anyway, yeah, Bill said she was doing good. So, any other prayer requests, oh, Becky? Pray for my attitude. I have been, my blood. You have a lousy attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My problem is my blood sugar. If I want to do it, I can't. I wanted to have shoulder surgery, so I got my A1C to 8. When I didn't want to do it, and I didn't care, it was 11 when I was in the hospital. Oh, I didn't care. Yeah. I so really now, so now you did not care. care. And that's what I told the doctor. If I care, I'll do it. Yeah. If I don't care, I won't. Well, that makes sense. Well, it was just everything at once. Yeah. 
Yeah. David's birthday was the ninth, and then the eleventh, the fifteenth was three months since he died. Here I'm in the hospital, and I was like, I don't care. I know. And then they tried to kill me while I was in the hospital. I was fine in ICU. They put me in a regular room, and they decided to give me insulin at night. I told them I don't take insulin at night, but they gave it to me anyway. So I called, told them not to go to the bathroom. My sugar is horribly low. They gave me a juice box. I call them again. My sugar is horribly low. They gave me another juice box. They come and check it at 70. My sugar is horribly low. So there's three juice boxes. I call them again, and I'm falling out of the bed. Well, Becky. They're sitting there with flashlights. Becky, Becky, calling my name, and I'm like, I told you it was too low. Well, Juice boxes is not fixing this. So here comes their supervisor looking at all this stuff. Well, you followed protocol. You did this. You did that. And I fucking almost killed me. <laughs> So the next month they come with the shot. So what is it? Insulin. No. I refuse You'll to take to this. Two stars on Yelp. Okay. But I was just like, if my attitude, if I want to, I will. If I don't and I don't care, I won't. So you need us to pray for your attitude to be better. That I care. I saw Medicare goes into effect on the first. So I, I can get go back on an insulin pump. Um, this Sunday will be two years since my grandma passed away. So pray for my grandpa and my dad. Well, how's he doing? He's doing, he's still in and out. He's taking it. He's okay. Well, good. Good. Well, Brianne got some kind of an award at the Bright Horizons graduation ceremony. What was that, Brianne? I volunteer. Uh -huh. I don't get paid, so I volunteer to work. Yeah. I've been doing this for 15 years. Yeah. I think that's wonderful, ladies. Mm -hmm. That's yes. the, an, an example of a giver mm -hmm. and not a taker. You know what we just talked about. She got an award Monday night, and it was well-deserved for you. She could have gotten an award at camp for being happy as camper. <laughs> I need some of your attitude. <laughs> All right, ladies, anything else? No. Pat, will you dismiss us? Yes, I, I forgot your mom's name. You said mom's name. Joy. 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 It's Joy McCoy. So Joy McCoy. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much, Father, for this group of women. And Father, whenever we go to those spots where we're lonely or isolated, help us to remember that you have sisters, that you have placed people in our lives that will reach out and that will care for us and lift us up. And we know, Father, that through prayer, you see us and you, you welcome our prayers. And we pray for joy. And we pray, Father, that the surgery goes well, that everything just comes about the way it should and that she feels your comfort and your peace. And, and I thank you, God, for this lesson that Nora gave us tonight on peace. It is something that I struggle with. I feel like pretty much everyone struggles with that. And Father, just help us to find that. And Father, with Becky and her attitude, it is very difficult sometimes to take care of ourselves and to want to change and think I I don't know just think on the bright side and um, Karen gives us a great example of that father and I pray father for Becky's attitude I just help her to see you and help her to see your face and help her to realize that there are people around her that look forward to being around her and that want to help her. And help her to think of that whenever she reaches those points where she just doesn't care. Help her to remember all that you have done, all that you will do, and all that you are. We thank you so much for all that you do. And Father, we're so blessed. And it's through your son that we can call on you. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.